So thank you all for being here this evening. Thanks for your patience as we got everybody logged in, including myself tonight. Um, so we are very excited to continue our parent academy. Um, and so last week we had our first session for this school year um, and it was a big hit and we'll actually be getting that video up onto the website hopefully tonight. Um, so if, if you're not aware, so all of our parent academies from last year, from this year, um, are all on the Onslow County Schools website um, under our college and career readiness. And there's a page there just for parent academy videos. So if you hear something tonight, this video will be there too. Um, we certainly welcome your questions. Um, Brittany, Brittany will be explaining, I'm sure, where to put those questions. So we'll kind of watch the chat. Um, we also welcome your ideas for more um, topics for our parent academies. These continue to grow. We collected a whole stack of ideas last week at the session. So, um, and then we met with our system involvement team and they gave us some more ideas. So um, this is meant to be a service um, to our community, but I also selfishly say that I learn so much in these sessions personally and professionally. So I don't want to take up all your time, but we'll be here watching the chat um, and here to, to give you the information that hopefully you are looking for. Um, I just say a special thank you to Brittany Privet with College Foundation North Carolina for helping lead these sessions and keeping us moving forward. So um, also thank you to Michelle Chadwick. See her up there. She is our director with advanced learning and STEM here at Onslow County Schools. So um, without further ado, let me throw it over to you, Brittany. Thank you so much, Dr. Elder. Um, it's been, we're two and a half years into the pandemic and I still struggle with that mute button. So <laughs> one day I'll get it. Uh, but I wanna thank Onslow County Schools for allowing me to partner with you all to kind of just spread information that it should be readily available, but sometimes feels like it's a little mystical these days. So uh, we are going to talk tonight mainly about the FAFSA and funding college overall. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Unfortunately, with WebEx, you're not able to unmute yourself. Um, but if you have questions or anything like that, feel free to put those in the chat. Dr. Elder and Michelle Chadwick will be answering those questions. Um, and then I will at the, I will pause a few times throughout the presentation just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, but again, my name is Brittany Privet. I am your regional rep for the College Foundation, and I live and work out of Wilmington, but I specifically cover the 910 area code, which includes Onslow County. Um, I would definitely say Onslow County is an extremely engaging county, and your students are fantastic. So anything I can do to help boost the knowledge about post-secondary opportunities, I am happy to help. So I've been really lucky to be able to work with Dr. Elder, Ms. Chadwick, and all of the team in Onslow County. And I'm looking forward to working with you all this evening. So we'll go ahead and get started. When it comes to the College Foundation as a whole, um, we are a state supported nonprofit and we work with students, families and adult learners all over the state of North Carolina to help students, families and adult learners plan, apply, pay and save for college in the state. We work with all of the entities that you see here on this lovely green wheel. We work with the UNC system, the College Foundation Incorporated, who is my employer. Um, we also work with the North Carolina Community College System, the Department of Public Instruction. North Carolina's independent colleges and universities and the State Education Assistance Authority to create CFNC.org. We founded CFNC.org in 2000, and it has been a free resource for students and families ever since. I applied to college on CFNC.org a very long time ago, um, so it's definitely been a great resource for students and families for a very long time. I do encourage that all of our seniors go ahead and create a CFNC account for free, um, and you are going to use this account, I promise, throughout your senior year, not only to plan for college, um, you can apply to college through CFNC.org. You can also send your high school transcript for free to any college in the state, whether you apply through us or not. And you can also utilize us for the residency determination interview. So lots of resources. Tonight, we're going to spend the most of our time talking about financial aid. If you do ever have questions or have issues logging into your account or anything like that, we have a call center in Raleigh and you are welcome to give them a call. They can unlock your account. They can help you navigate the site. Um, and I'm also here to help as well. 
I want to make sure students and families are aware that October is North Carolina's Countdown to College Month that is sponsored by CFNC. So we are very excited to encourage our students and families to complete their FAFSA, their applications for admission, and their residency determination interview for in-state tuition and grant purposes. And we have tons of things going on that month to support you throughout those processes. So first we have um, week one, we're going to be focusing on College and career planning, we do have this year. This is going to be very brand new. We're really excited about it. We're going to have a virtual career fair for trades and apprenticeships. So students who really want to get into the workforce and start um, supporting the lifestyle that they want to live and getting out there into the community, you have the opportunity to learn more about different opportunities, especially at our North Carolina Community Colleges. The second week, we're going to be focusing on FAFSA and RDS, uh, and we do have different webinars to help students and families along the way with those specific forms. Week three is going to be free application week, which is usually a very fun time here in the state of North Carolina. That is when a bulk of our colleges will be actually waiving their college application fees. And we do encourage students to check out what schools are going to be waiving those fees. They can go to our college search and search to see what schools will be waiving fees. And October 1st, we will be releasing a list of colleges in the state that will be waiving their fees during that week. So check that out. We also have I applied now what on the 4th week of, of October to make sure that you're ready to tie up loose ends and move forward with the rest of your senior year. So stay tuned, check out CFNC.org slash C2C to learn more about different resources we have for you throughout the month of October to encourage you to start thinking ahead and thinking about life after high school. All right, let's roll into the big stuff uh, when it comes to college. We really want students and families to start thinking and budgeting for the costs that you're going to occur, incur um, throughout your time in college. And it, the more you plan, the easier it's going to be and the less you're going to have to pay. I promise you, if you start planning ahead and applying for scholarships and doing these things, it's going to make it a lot easier for you and your family. So when it comes to the college costs and things that we need to start thinking about when it comes to budgeting, we're going to think about two sets of costs. Our direct costs are going to be costs that we're actually going to receive an actual bill for for the institution and that's going to include tuition that's everything academic your required fees are anything on campus that's kind of miscellaneous park or parking sometimes is a required fee um, laundry on campus can be covered in those required fees sporting events things like that some schools have book programs that are built into their required fees it's very different at every school um, but you're going to have to pay student fees wherever you go to school there's also room and board and that's where you sleep and eat on campus that is definitely a personal decision on whether or not you would like to live on campus that is something that we encourage students and families to talk about um, i will say statistics show that students who live on campus their first year at a four-year institution typically have a higher GPA than those who do not, and they're more likely to stay in school and graduate on time. That's a great way to get connected with the campus community and learn about what resources are available to you that are, you're already paying for in those required fees. So we definitely recommend um, that you talk to your family about living and eating on campus. Indirect costs are costs that you are definitely responsible for, but you may not receive a direct bill for from the institution. So those are going to include books and supplies, and that varies greatly depending on your major. So just keep in mind, chemistry majors are not paying the same amount as math majors when it comes to books and supplies. So just know that that budget's going to look different from major to major. Transportation is going to include transportation to and from campus, but also around the town that your campus is located in. Some schools include transportation in their required fees and provide a shuttle for students so they don't have to pay out of pocket for as they go to class every day. However, some schools do not. Also, if you're sending your child to Western Carolina from Onslow County, you're going to want to budget on how to get them to and from Cullowhee every semester for big breaks and things like that over the summer. Um, so we want you to start thinking about those transportation fees and then personal miscellaneous. We want you to start thinking about supporting kind of a whole separate household. Those sundry items that your student uses, those things that they use every day, like paper towels, silverware, things like that. You're going to want to budget for that stuff if your child is going off to college and possibly living in a place that doesn't provide those items. So when it comes to paying for college, these are the things that we really want you to start thinking about when it comes to budgeting. When it comes to financial aid terms, there's a ton of different kind of 
terms that they use. There is a total like financial aid lingo out there, and we want to kind of make sure that everybody understands what they're getting themselves into. So um, gift aid is going to include the free money, everybody's favorite money, um, grants and scholarships are going to be monies that you do not have to pay back. Self-help is money that you work for um, to pay now or to pay off later. So that's going to be employment on campus or loans. Merit-based aid is the money that you get for being special. So that's going to include academic scholarships, music scholarships, athletic scholarships, things that you get for being unique or possessing a quality that is different from other students. I will say merit-based aid is the type of aid that you need to seek out and apply for. There are tons of scholarships out there that go on a unclaimed every year. So we do en encourage you to seek out different scholarship opportunities and apply, 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 not only just this year, but throughout your time in college. There are scholarships for current college students, and we encourage you to seek those opportunities out. And we are going to spend the bulk of our time tonight discussing need-based aid, and that is based on the FAFSA form. That's going to include your federal and state grant and loan programs. Ultimately, after all funds are awarded by an institution, so your grants, your scholarships, all of that, whatever the remaining balance is, the family is responsible for paying those fees. So just keep that in mind. We want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and applying for different opportunities. So the remaining balance is as small as possible. So way back in the day, the federal government wanted to figure out a way to equitably offer financial aid for students wanting to continue their, to continue their education after high school. So they came up the, with the FAFSA form, which is the free application for federal student aid. What happens with the FAFSA is you're going to provide tax information to let the federal government know how much or how little you make. Um, they're also going to ask about your students' information. So if they worked, they're going to want their tax information. They're also going to calculate how many people live in your household and how many of those people are attending college. Once they do that, they're going to come up with a magical number called the expected family contribution. And that's how much the federal government says that your family can offer, or excuse me, can provide when it comes to supporting your student in college, how much they can contribute to your child's education. Schools will then have to take their direct and indirect costs, which we call cost of attendance. They'll subtract your EFC, your expected family contribution, and the amount they come up with is the maximum amount they can offer you with state and federal funds for need-based financial aid. I know that's a lot, but the FAFSA form is pretty much your way of letting the federal government know where you are financially so that they can determine how much your family is going to need when it comes to paying for college. The first step in the FAFSA process is obtaining your FSA ID, and that is going to be your signature and your login for the FAFSA from now until you are done with college completely, okay? We're going to need that for the student and one parent. Even if the student lives in a two-parent household, we just need an FSA ID for one parent. This is something that students can do now, and I highly encourage that you do now. There is an approval process for the FSA ID. So if you want to get a head start on the FAFSA process, you can go to studentaid.gov and set up your FSA ID for the student and one parent so that when October 1st rolls around, you are ready to go ahead and dive into the FAFSA form. So that is a piece of homework for my seniors on the call. Go ahead and set up your FSA ID to go ahead and get ready for the month of October. This is what it's going to look like. Um, it's a little more updated now, actually, but it's going to show you that you um, indicate that you're the student, set up your FSA ID, and then the parent will set one up as well. The FAFSA opens October 1st every year, and it is an annual process. So as long as you're in college, we are encouraging you to complete your FAFSA form every October to make sure that you're maximizing your opportunities for funding. I will say the first year is a doozy. You have to set up your FAFSA account when it comes to the FSA ID. You have to put in all of your information, but every subsequent year, you're just updating the form. So it does get simpler as you move through college. Every college has their own priority deadline when it comes to the FAFSA form and having that completed. However, we recommend that you complete it as early as possible. Typically, the FAFSA is time stamped in colleges when they get permission from the federal government to start creating financial aid packages. They have to start with the students who completed their FAFSA first. So we are really encouraging students to go ahead and get their FAFSA done as early as possible to ensure that they are receiving the funds that they're entitled to. 
You can put up to 10 colleges on your FAFSA form. And so I recommend that if you are thinking about a school, go ahead and put it on your FAFSA because once you're admitted, if you have a FAFSA completed and that school is already on your FAFSA form, the financial aid will, office will get a notification to go ahead and start creating that financial aid package for you. So that being said, it is really important that you add the schools that you're applying to on your FAFSA as you go through the application process, because the FAFSA residency and your applications are all separate processes until you're accepted. When you're accepted, they all start to link together. So we recommend that you do them together so that as you are accepted, everything kind of flows well. Do not wait until you're accepted. You do not, you don't have to wait until you're accepted. We encourage you to get this done as you go through the application process, specifically in the month of October, if you can. Now, we are in uh, modern times and students are very independent these days. A lot of students have driver's licenses before they graduate high school. A lot of students have part-time jobs and are really starting to gain independence. But according to the federal government and according to the FAFSA form, you are dependent of your parents until you turn 24. You're also a dependent of your parents until you're, or it, really, to be, un, to be honest, it is until you're 24 or any of the following bullet points. So unless you're 24, you're married, you're working on a master's or a doctorate, you have children that you support more than 50%, or you're active duty or a veteran of the armed forces, you are gonna be a dependent student according to the FAFSA, okay? Now, we also have some special circumstances where students can be deemed an independent student However, um, it is required that you have some type of paperwork, okay? So that includes um, the Kenny Vento paperwork, custody paperwork, things like that. So students that can be deemed an independent student are students who have experienced foster care since the age of 13, have been determined a ward of the court or an emancipated minor, or students who have experienced homelessness since July 1st of their senior year. There will be documentation, again, that is, is required to prove these situations, but those students can be deemed an independent student. All right, when it comes to who the parents are on the FAFSA, that is going to be the biological or adoptive parents of the student if they live together, whether they're married or not. So if mom and dad live together, if they are adoptive parents or biological parents, they're going to both go on the FAFSA. If we have a single parent situation where the parent was either widowed or never married to the other parent, we're just going to put the single parent on the FAFSA. We don't have to worry about finding other information. If it's a divorce situation, we're going to go with the parent with whom the child spends the most time with. If it is an even 50-50 split, we're going to go with the parent who supports the child the most financially. It has nothing to do with who claims who on the taxes, which is the common misconception when it comes to the FAFSA. So just, just be aware that it has to do more with who the child spends the most time with or who supports them the most financially. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? Any questions in the chat that I can answer? So Brittany, the one question right now in the chat is, um, is the FAFSA a requirement to receive financial aid from an institution? Very good question. I love this question. Um, a lot of parents and students are, are a little weary of doing the FAFSA form, especially if they feel like they're not going to be offered any free money, any grant money. And we do recommend that you still complete the form because there are institutional scholarships that do require a FAFSA be on file, whether there's need or not. So sometimes there are need blind scholarships that still require a FAFSA be on file, either by the institution, or sometimes there's scholarships that are tied to federal funds that require a FAFSA be on file. So we do encourage all students and families who are able to complete the FAFSA to do so. And when I say able to complete a FAFSA, I mean students and families who have um, or U.S. citizenship and have a social security number, we do recommend that you go ahead and complete the FAFSA to ensure that you are opening yourself up for any financial aid opportunities available. Were there any other questions in the chat, Dr. Elder? Not yet, but keep them coming there. We'll keep our eyes over there. So, and I think somebody is pointing out, I think, I don't think you can see as a participant, I don't think you're going to see the questions, but they'll come to us as panelists. So just drop them in there. We'll, we'll keep an eye over there. Awesome. Thank you. 
All right. Now, there are some special circumstances that students can't really explain on their FAFSA form. This is the time when it's when we need to communicate with financial aid offices. Now, I know students are applying to tons of different schools. Um, I know students that are applying to schools that 15 different schools. You do not have to contact 15 different schools and tell your personal information. However, I would narrow it down to your top three and make sure that you are communicating whether or not you cannot, excuse me, students who can't get in touch with their parents, students who may have an incarcerated parent, students who are in a situation where their parents will not share information. You need to communicate that with the financial aid offices because financial aid administrators are the only people who can amend your FAFSA and make sure that information is available. So please make sure that you're communicating with financial aid offices so that you can get the money that you're entitled to. Now, when it comes to the FAFSA, we're going to use our taxes from two years prior to your enrollment year. So our seniors right now will be enrolling in fall of 2023. So we're going to use our 2021 taxes on the FAFSA form. I understand that ever since 2019, we have found ourselves in a very precarious time <laughs> and things have happened and things have shifted quickly. So if anything has happened since you filed your taxes in 2021 and the enrollment year, so in between that time, those are things that you're going to need to communicate with financial aid offices as well. So if there's been a change in employment status with parents, if there's been a death in the family, a change in parents' marital status, medical expenses that were not covered by insurance that dramatically changed your financial situation. Or again, if a student can't obtain their, fa their family's information, they need to make sure that they're communicating to these financial aid offices. I also wanna make sure students know that this is not rare, it happens. So just keep in mind, it is okay to communicate this. It will be confidential with the financial aid offices and they are prepared to help you. So please, please, please reach out and communicate. Now, when we're doing our FAFSA, like I said, you're going to be using your tax information from two years prior to the student's enrollment year. So that's going to be the parent and students adjusted gross income, their money from their earnings from work and tax liability directly from their IRS form. And we'll talk about that in just a second. They're also going to need your untaxed income as of two years prior to the enrollment year. And then the asset information as of the day you complete your FAFSA. It is going to have that on the questions. What is your asset information as of today? Or what is your tax information as of two years ago? So you don't have to remember this per se, but as you prepare and gather your documents, it's good to know. So when it comes to asset information, they're going to need your cash savings and checking account information, other real estate outside of your home and investments. If you have a family business that is less than 100 employees, it does not need to be reported. However, if you have more than 100 employees, it does need to be reported on your FAFSA form. If you have an investment farm that does need to be in, like included on your FAFSA form, but if you have a small family farm or if you have a couple of goats or chickens in the backyard, that does not have to go on your FAFSA, um, so keep that in mind. Now, when I said the tax forms, um, a lot of people will gather their tax forms and go ahead and manually enter it into their FAFSA form. Um, I know I had to do that when I completed my FAFSA, but it is 2022 and the IRS and US Department of Education's website now communicate with each other, which is fantastic because you can now auto populate your tax information right into your FAFSA form. Excuse me, the rule of thumb with this is that you have to make sure that you enter your information exactly out how it shows up on your tax information so that the FAFSA can pull that information from the IRS. So, for example, I live on a street, so sometimes I write ST, sometimes I write street out. If I wrote street out on my taxes, I have to write it out on this so it can identify me in the system. We encourage students and families to utilize the IRS data retrieval tool because not only does it make it easier for us, but it also makes your FAFSA more accurate and it makes you less likely to be flagged for what we call verification, which is a flat FAFSA audit. So we definitely encourage you to do this. You must have filed your taxes electronically to be able to retrieve them. But other than that, you should be good to go. Any other questions? I saw you look up, Dr. Elder. <laughs> nope. Nope, just scanning back and forth to, to <laughs> <laughs> Please do put those questions in there because sometimes there's things we just haven't thought about. Exactly. Them. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. After you're done with all of that rigmarole, you're going to get a signature page from the FAFSA. It's going to ask for the FSA ID that we talked about before for the student and the parent that will act as your signature. 
And then you're going to receive a confirmation page. If you do not receive a confirmation page, you are not done with the FAFSA. So go back and check and just make sure everything is, is answered. Um, once you receive your confirmation page, you will be notified that you're going to receive an email within three to five business days, giving you more information about your FAFSA and that is being processed. You'll also get an estimated EFC so that you get a kind of a gauge of how what your EFC is going to look like. Um, and a little more information about the schools that you have on your FAFSA. When we're doing the FAFSA, we're applying for federal and state grant and loan programs. So we're applying for the federal Pell Grant, which goes to our lower middle income and our lower income families in the United States. We also are applying for the federal supplemental grant for our low income families. We are applying for federal work study, and I highly recommend that all students just indicate that they'd like to be considered for work study. When we are talking about the things that you're applying for, you do not have to accept any of this money or opportunities, but you're just casting out a wide net and trying to see what you're going to qualify for. And when it comes to work study, I'm going to go into this a little bit later, but work study is just an opportunity to receive a certain amount of financial aid dollars that you can work for on campus. Like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I do recommend that students um, go ahead and select that they'd like to be considered for federal work study because it's definitely a great opportunity. We're also applying for direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans to the federal government. Again, you do not have to accept any loans or any money is being offered, but you are applying for it and it's good to know what you, apply, you um, qualify for. For the state of North Carolina, you're applying for the UNC need-based grant, which goes to our 16 public four-year schools. You're applying to the North Carolina Community College grant, the North Carolina need-based scholarship, which goes to our private institutions, and then the North Carolina Education Lottery Scholarship, which goes to any of our public institutions. That's gonna include our two and four-year institutions. So when you're doing the FAFSA, these are things that you're automatically applying for. Now, student loans are kind of a touchy subject these days, and it is a part of the college process. I will say that the College Foundation does have a small loan. We call it a gap loan because we only want you to take out a loan after you've accepted all of your free money. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because in the past, our parent rate, um, our interest rate for the parent loan has been less than the federal government. There are private loans out there. We do have smart borrower calculators on CFNC so that you can make an informed decision about what loans you take out. Um, again, it is a personal decision, but I just want to make sure that you're aware of this opportunity. Another opportunity I want to make sure you're aware about um, or aware of is our no essay scholarship. We do a monthly drawing for this scholarship for $1,000. So we are encouraging students to go in and, and fill out the form just to see if they could be um, eligible. And yeah, that's all you have to do is fill out a small form. You don't have to write an essay or do anything crazy. You'll go to cfnc.org slash NC Assist Scholarship to fill out the form. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. All right, we have a couple of other financial aid programs in the state of North Carolina that are not covered by the FAFSA that are separate applications, but we want to make you aware of. And two specifically, I want to point out this evening. One is the Golden Leaf Scholarship. Onslow County is a Golden Leaf County. Um, this money is given out by the Tobacco Trust, and it is for tobacco dependent counties in the state of North Carolina. There is a two year and a four year scholarship that you can apply for, depending on what kind of institution you'd like to attend. It is a hefty scholarship. It also includes a leadership conference and a paid internship. So we definitely encourage students who specifically want to serve their local communities apply for the Golden Leaf Scholarship because it is a fantastic opportunity. Also, in the state of North Carolina, we are trying to boost certain employment um, areas, specifically education, allied health, nursing, any medical field. Those majors change from year to year based on employment rates in the state, but I encourage students and families to check out cfnc.org slash FELS, which stands for the Forgivable Education Loan for Service, because you can get up to $7,000 a year to go to college in those specific majors, as long as you commit to working in the state of North Carolina for the amount of time you receive the money. 
We do not want to put any students in a precarious situation. So we do prefer students who have already declared their major and committed to a specific major, um, because if you decide to change your mind or you decide not to work in the state of North Carolina, it does turn into a loan. So if you know you want to be a special education teacher when you grow up, or if you know you wanna be a nurse or go to med school, I definitely recommend checking out the FELS list because it is a great opportunity. I do have a lot of students who live in southeastern North Carolina who say, I am leaving, I am going to move out and go to the big city, or I'm going to go to the West Coast. I want to make sure that you know North Carolina is seven hours wide. We have some amazing cities here in the state. I promise you, if you go to Boone, you are not going to feel like you're in the same state as Hounslow County because they're very different places all over this state. So definitely check out the fells um, and just know that your commitment is just working in the state for the amount of years that you receive the money. All right, so timeline was, I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page. So like we said before, October is gonna be a very busy month for students. We want you to complete your applications, your FAFSA and your residency to put yourself in a good spot to be able to have a uh, less stressful spring semester. If you get all of those things done in the month of October, you're gonna to start to receive your financial aid, or excuse me, your admissions decisions starting in November all the way through January. They're then going to start to receive your financial aid packages of the schools you've been admitted to, typically late February, early March. Then you have until May 1st to decide on whether or not a school is going to be a good fit for you. So we recommend getting stuff done in October so that we don't run into not having enough time to decide. That being said, after you complete your FAFSA and you receive that financial aid award notice in the spring semester, on that notice, you're going to see the cost of attendance in your EFC, that formula I showed you before. You're gonna get information about the aid being offered. So whether or not there's a GPA requirement to maintain this aid, um, if there's volunteer hours required for your scholarship, things like that. You're also gonna get a reminder to report any outside scholarships to the institution so they can adjust your financial aid package. You're gonna get an itemized list of your aid being awarded and how to accept or decline that aid. You'll also get any terms and conditions and details on what accepting that aid is going to entail. So the next slide is going to be an example of what financial aid packages look like. And I wanna prepare everybody. Let's put ourselves in the mindset of a high school senior who is very type A. They are a spreadsheet person. So they have received their financial aid packages and they decide to put them on a spreadsheet so they can compare and contrast their financial aid packages. The reason we use this as an example is because we want you to sit down and compare and contrast your financial aid packages to ensure that we're making informed decisions on what we're getting ourselves into financially when it comes to going to college. So as you can see here, Campus A, Campus B, and Campus C have very different cost of attendance. The students EFC is going to be the same at every school because that's determined by the FAFSA. Schools will subtract the EFC from their cost of attendance. And this third line here, you are going to see um, the maximum amount they can offer for need-based aid. This next line is merit-based aid. So it has nothing to do with the FAFSA. It has to do with the student being special by having some type of special quality. And that varies from school to school. Some schools have a lot of need-based aid or merit-based aid they can offer. Some schools do not. So just keep that in mind. The student received a need-based grant at each school. They also received work study through the FAFSA. Typically the biggest difference between work study and a regular campus job is the pot from which they pay you. So for example, my first year in college, my mom was a teacher. I have two younger brothers and she was a single parent. So I qualified for work study. I was a tour guide on campus and I worked in the admissions office and I was allotted a specific amount, just like the student here, where I could work on campus and make up to that amount for the semester. They would pay me out of that pot of money reserved out of my financial aid. The next year, my mom was an administrator, so she had a pay bump. I did not qualify for work study. However, I got to keep my same campus job and the admissions office then paid me from their student worker budget. So that's really the only difference between a work study position, a federal work study position and a general job on campus. Every campus calls their student jobs something different and some of them call all of their jobs work study jobs, but there's a difference between work study and federal work study and federal work study is determined by the FAFSA. After that, we see that he was offered some loans here um, and 
his total aid is on this line. At the very bottom, we see that his total out of pocket is very different and is very different from the sticker price of these institutions. The reason we put this example up here is because we don't want students to apply or not apply to an institution just based off sticker price because financial aid award notices can really change the game and really shift that price to make a school more affordable or less affordable than you thought it would be. So just keep that in mind. Wait for those financial aid packages to come out. Communicate with financial aid about your situations so that you can make school as affordable as possible. Do we have any questions? We do, although I, I just want to pause there for a second, because I think this is such a you said it and I just want to reiterate like that whole piece of their sticker shock to just about anything significant that we buy in life. And so, um, although sometimes that is a time to say, hmm, maybe I can get the same opportunity somewhere else. That's very fair, too. But there are plenty of places um, like you give the example here that where the actual cost is not. So. In, in my very layman's way, this is uh, this is the Kohl's effect, right? Like there, there are price tags on Kohl's clothes that no one, very few people actually pay. So um, give give other places the opportunity to, to try to fund some of that or just discount from the university or the college itself. Uh, so we did have one question in the chat and um, I think I have an answer to this, but I think you probably have a better answer, Brittany, so I'll throw it to you. So, um, <laughs> So knowing that, you know, tonight, even with CFNC, this is more specific to North Carolina. Um, the question from Tina was, do other states have a similar program for students? And, I, and I'm thinking, and Tina, please elaborate if, you, if I'm not interpreting this correctly, a similar program, I'm assuming, to CFNC to provide this kind of information um, for folks maybe who are going to a school in another state. Fantastic question. Um, so there's a two part answer. The first part is the FAFSA is federal. So the FAFSA is going to apply to any school that is accredited by the US Department of Education. So that includes schools in the US and schools abroad that are accredited um, by the US Department of Ed. The second part, CFNC is sponsored by the state. We were the first organization in the country um, that is like this. Um, and every state is very different. I am not familiar with um, other states programs. However, if you're looking for a way to look kind of nationally, I recommend checking out the college board. Um, North Carolina is kind of, is kind or CFNC is kind of North Carolina's version of the college board. It's kind of a condensed version. Um, I definitely recommend um, checking out the college board because it is a more kind of bolstered opportunity to look for schools, look for scholarship opportunities on a national level. Um, and if you're wondering who the college board is, they're the ones that um, administer and and kind of govern AP tests and the SAT. Did you have anything to add to that, Dr. Elder? No, I think that's, the, I, I was honestly, I'm, I wasn't as aware if other states had a version of CFNC either. So, and another place you can always ask those questions is the admissions office of any school in that state. So, if we call, if somebody called, UNCW and said, hey, is there somebody I could talk to about this? They're going to try to address it, but they're also aware of CFNC. So I assume if there's something in another state, that would be a good a good place to ask because admissions officers are experts in that too. So um, or financial aid offices. So the second question in the chat, another good one from Andrea. Um, so it was if you receive free money in whatever form, if you receive free money that exceeds the required cost of the institution, can the school still give you aid? I d my initial answer is no, if that money goes directly to the school. If this money goes to the student, then yes. Um, scholarships are very different when it comes to how they disperse the money. Sometimes they only disperse it to the institution. Sometimes they disperse it directly to the student. If it goes to the institution, they can't exceed a certain amount. Um, after tuition and fees are paid, there is a certain amount that they can offer the student as what we call a refund check. So that does go to their pocket. Um, however, they can't just keep adding to your account. So um, that's kind of the long and short of it. If you want to email me, I can connect you with a financial aid person or I can get the answer from a financial aid person that kind of outlines exactly what that looks like um, with more detail. And a lot of times, as I think you're saying there too, a lot of times if I'm getting a scholarship, that's going to go to my 
my academic paying for my my tuition so a lot that aid may go towards paying for my my room and board or those kind of things so different different pots there that money can be spread across to so great question just but there is going to come they've taken as much money and it's hit their if, if they paid everything that they know to pay then that's going to be the end of how much they'll offer Yes, 100%, 100%. But if you apply for a scholarship um, through the Kiwanis Club or your local YMCA or things like that, and they give the check directly to the student, that is something the student can use at their discretion. Because you can choose to use that to buy books with, right? And that exactly. wouldn't have anything to do with any of those things. So. Exactly. Right. Transportation, laundry, things that, you know, students need. <laughs> Pizza, <laughs> ramen noodles, all of those fun things. <laughs> All right, uh, we are almost done with this information, but I want to make sure everybody knows kind of what to expect after you complete your FAFSA. After you complete the form, students, I cannot stress this enough to you all. You need to check your email every single day from now until eternity, because this is how colleges are going to communicate with you. And some of the things they're communicating are time sensitive, specifically verification. The FAFSA does a random audit um, where they may flag you for verification and the, co the college is Excuse me, the college is going to notify you if you've been flagged for verification. They're also going to tell you exactly what documentation they need to, so that they can go ahead and fulfill those requirements for verification and move forward with your financial aid package. So checking your email every day is super duper important. Again, you're going to want to respond to any questions for the financial aid office, and usually those questions are going to come in via email. You're going to receive your financial aid award notification. Like I said, when we were talking about that timeline, you're going to want to make sure that you let schools know that you're coming or not. So once you commit to a school, that there is a process to commit to a school and the school, it varies from school to school. It is a courtesy to let other schools know that you're not coming, but that's not necessarily required. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then again, notify campuses of all outside scholarships that are going to go to that institution so they can adjust that financial aid package. Now, another process that is required to receive as much funding as possible is the residency determination process. In 2016, the state of North Carolina made it law that you have to go through a residency determination interview through our centralized service to be deemed an in-state student for tuition and grant purposes. You're going to find that online interview at ncresidency.org or CFNC's application hub, and you're going to use your CFNC login credentials to log into the residency interview. It's going to ask questions about your parents' domicile and how long you've lived in the state of North Carolina. So they're going to ask about your driver's license, state insurance, state taxes, things like that, to determine if you've been here for a solid year with the purpose of setting up a permanent residence. After you go through the process, it's going to give you what we call a residency certification number or an RCN. And all of the college applications in the state are going to ask for that number. You're going to put that number in to show that you're an in-state resident. Um, for our public schools, that's going to give you in-state tuition, which is about 40% cheaper than out-of-state tuition. And then it's also going to qualify you for those in-state grants at our private institutions. So regardless of where you're going in the state of North Carolina, you do have to go through the residency process. If you decide you are not going to apply to any North Carolina schools whatsoever, this is a process you can skip. However, I do recommend because students are likely to change their minds and that's okay to go ahead and go through the process. We have a lot of military families in Onzo County and I thank you all for your service. If you have orders to be here in the state of North Carolina, then that will qualify you for in-state um, residency. There are military specific questions. Um, so just answer those accordingly to determine that in-state residency. This slide is an example of the documentation you're gonna need when it comes to a applying for the FAFSA and for residency. Um, I will email this PowerPoint to Dr. Elder so that it can be available to whoever needs it. Um, and again, we are recording this session, so it will be on the Onslow County Schools website. So if you do need um, any of this information, do not hesitate to reach out to one of us and we'll be more than happy to provide it for you. Now, like I said, CFMC provides tons of free resources for students, families, and adult learners. On the very top of the CFNC website, you're going to see different tab options. One of them is pay for college. If you click that tab, 
There's going to be a ton of information there to help you make informed decisions and learn about different scholarship and grant opportunities. We have a scholarship search engine with over 100 scholarships just for North Carolina students, um, and that includes students who are North Carolina residents, students who are not North Carolina residents, students who may not have U.S. citizenship. We do have scholarships available there, so I definitely recommend checking that out. We have a financial literacy course that students can take to get prepared for um, just kind of the financial woes of adulthood. Um, if you do that course and complete that course, you will be entered into win a $500 scholarship. There are tons of different calculators on our site, um, including a smart borrower calculator, comparing financial aid calculators, things like that. So we definitely recommend that you check out the pay tab and learn more about what's out there. Last but not least, scholarships are a huge part of the college application process. And like I said before, you're gonna to wanna to continuously apply for scholarships throughout your senior year and your time in college. Our rule of thumb is start with the FAFSA and then go local. Look at scholarships provided at your high school because you're not gonna be competing with as many students. Then I encourage you to be nosy and start looking at scholarship websites for other high schools in Onslow County because you may qualify for those scholarships, even if you're not a student of those respective high schools. Then we want you to look at those state based scholarships and you can check those out on CFNC.org. Ask institutions about scholarships that they provide. Some institutions like UNC Wilmington, for example, have a separate scholarship application and a deadline for that. So to be qualified for any institutional scholarships, you have to fill out a separate application. And then we want you to look at those national scholarships. Now, there are some scams out there, so we do encourage you to be careful before you apply for scholarships on a national level. Do not ever, ever, ever pay to apply for a scholarship or provide credit card information and things like that. But the sites that we list here, we found to be reputable sources for national scholarships. And one of them you see here is the College Board. So we really trust the College Board as a, a trusted resource um, for a very long time in the US. So definitely check them out. We're on all forms of social media and we post a lot of different things to kind of help students and families throughout this process. Our YouTube channel is chock full of different videos that range from two minutes to over an hour um, to kind of help you and uh, learn more about different college opportunities in the States. And this is my information. Um, feel free to email me if you ever have questions. I don't typically meet with families one on one. I work more on a, a macro scale. So if you need to be connected with resources or anything like that, do not hesitate to reach out to me. I adore Onzo County Schools. I love working with um, the people that I work with in Onzo County Schools because they're passionate about student success. So anything I can do to support the amazing culture y'all have in Onzo County Schools, I am all for it. So thank you so much for um, taking the time out of your evening this evening to join us and learn more about funding college. Do we have any other questions in the chat? We do not right now, but... Um... We just want to give everybody a second to drop in there. And if you aren't, just to make sure everybody is seeing the chat. Oh, yeah. So Andrew is asking, can you go back to the slide with the scholarship search? Yes. Yeah, so many good resources there uh, and such good advice. If somebody's charging you for that information, there's a good chance that there's reason to be suspicious there. So. Uh, so in the chat, I did drop the the next couple options for our parent academies. Um, some of them are more specific, but I want to jump first and just hit on the October 10th. So a lot of tonight was about the FAFSA. And if you're like me, I hear lots of information and I, I want somebody to sit beside me and just say, really click here and it'll be okay. Um, and so that that event is happening on October 10th at the public library. Um, and so there's no registration for that. It's just a show up first come first served um, in, the, in the Jacksonville branch of the public library. Um, but I will also say our, our partners at Coastal Carolina Community College or any university will do the same thing. So you can set up a time you call call Coastal or let us know. We'll help you get connected. Um, and they it doesn't matter where you're going to school. They will help you fill out the FAFSA, especially for families. Well, for any family, but I also always think of our families who may have special situations, you may have children living with you that are you're in a guardianship for, you may have children, you may be in a, in a, in a divorce situation. So all those create more bumps in the road. Uh, just know there are people who know all those bumps for us and they can they can navigate them. So just like I say, know that that is happening on October 10th. 
Um, and additionally, we've got things coming up for if you've got a high school junior who's interested in governor school, we're going to do a virtual overview that's also being held face to face at Southwest High School um, that evening. But we'll be broadcasting on teams there. Um, we're having a workshop for students on Saturday, October 1st. So if you have a student who is a senior and is writing those essays for their application um, or for scholarships, we're having a work right here at the central office. So there's a um, that one we do ask that you sign up in advance if possible. So that link is in the chat there for essay day. Um, and then we do, like I say, we post all these to our website and so and on our Facebook group. The last thing I will ask everybody is help us spread the word, right? So um, whether it's at your church, at your school, at the soccer field, you know, wherever it is, sometimes it's just hard to get word out to people um, in, a, in a way that where it connects with them. So if this has been beneficial to you, uh, we just ask, you know, tell a neighbor, tell a friend, text somebody now and say, hey, you need to come to the one on <laughs> the next one. Uh, not because it benefits us, but because we just want to make sure that the the, you're getting the support as parents and community members that you deserve. So I don't see any new comments in the chat, but we're glad to hang on for a minute or two here. And again, I think like, it's not recording. Like, 